Legislative Council. Uh, this is your second look at H143. Um, the underlying bill proposed to eliminate the required election of town agents and to replace that required election with the optional appointment of town agents. After hearing some testimony, the committee asked me to prepare an amendment uh, to instead completely remove town agents from statute, either as an elected position or as an optional appointed position. The reason being, there are not many town agents still in existence out there, and the testimony from towns and from the Vermont League of Cities and towns indicated that uh, town agents have largely been replaced by municipal attorneys. The first section repeals Subdivision 11 and 17 BSA 2646 to remove the required election of town <coughs> agent. As it currently stands, this is a position that must be elected <coughs> unless the municipality has a charter indicating otherwise. Section 2 uh, deals with town agents by another name. So uh, part of my testimony in the underlying bill is that town agents have all sorts of names inside of the Vermont statutes annotated, and one that VLCT highlighted as problematic is the reference here to an agent to convey real estate. So whenever the municipality wanted to convey a piece of land the town agent or the agent to convey real estate uh, had to certify that transaction. This particular section did allow, if there was no elected town agent or if the select board failed to appoint one, that there be some sort of process for appointment. All of that is being replaced with uh, select board <coughs> designation of a town agent for the purpose of the express purpose of uh, conveying that piece of real estate. And at the end here, with some cleanup, um, the requirement that that designation be certified to the town clerk remains. Uh, the next few sections are gonna be some clean, oh. Mr. Harrison. Okay, so back on section two, where we wait back right there. Take out elector or appointed, and we just put it designated. Does that, let's say it's a very, very small town that doesn't want to hire an attorney every time for example, pass, and they designate somebody who's not an attorney to do this? Yes. Okay, um, the LCT when they were testifying about this section, alluded to wanting to see some sort of um, insurance certification tied to this. But absent an example of where that is required for any other municipal officer, uh, the way that this section had already been constructed is that the agent got the authority to convey real estate through the select board appointment or their election. There was no requirement for even a town agent who would have this responsibility to have a license to perform this specific function. Okay. Thank you. The next few sections clean up uh, parts of the tax title where the town agent was given specific duties. And in each instance, instead of the elected town agent being the officer that is gonna carry forth these duties, it will be an individual that is designated by the legislative body. So you'll see that here with reference to appeals from listers to the grand list. In section four, this is again, grand list appeal procedures. Um, in many cases, a town agent wasn't the only officer that could carry forth this duty. So in those instances, again, the legislative body is allowed to designate an agent. Section six begins uh, some charter cleanup work. So there are charters out there uh, 
that have either elected or appointed town agents expressly listed in their charter provisions. So one of the uh, points I raised in my testimony to the committee is that if town agents were going to be completely eliminated from general law, then each chartered town that had an officer in their charter, town agent in their charter, was going to have to come back to eliminate it. Otherwise, they were going to have to continue with their election or appointment. Uh, I went through the charters. I found each chartered municipality that had either a required, elected, or appointed town agent um, and reached out to those municipalities at the direction of the chair and the vice chair to see whether they wanted to remove their town agent. So the first, South Burlington, that's section six, confirmed that they no longer wanted to have the um, required appointment of a city agent. In section seven, the town of Hardwick uh, also confirmed that they no longer wanted to have the elected town agent. Okay, so South Burlington is identified here. How would I know? One of the reasons that when we do our charter amendments, we amend the entire chapter is because the chapter heading contains the name of the municipality. So right off the bat, at the beginning of the bill, you would see the city of South Burlington or the town of Hartwick. And uh, in this case, these are individual sections. So, so we just have to make sure we Section eight is uh, the town of Milton, and thankfully there was an officer from that town available to directly respond to this. Um, so the town had a, an interesting office of town attorney slash town agent, and the request was that the town agent portion be struck. Section nine is the town of Springfield. They indicated they no longer wanted to have an elected town agent. Section 10 is a bit more interesting than the previous. The town of Westford uh, asked the town agent be struck from their list of appointed officers. And last year, the General Assembly removed grand jurors as a required office. And when we reached out to Westford to see if they wanted to get rid of their town agent, they said, could you also get rid of the pesky grand juror? because last year you passed it and we haven't had an opportunity to amend our charter to strike grand jury yet. Hmm. It was a grand jury. Oh. That's so sad. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you ever call them by? No. <laughs> uh, section 11 is for the village of Morrisville. And I don't know if any of you have contacted the village of Morrisville before, but the trustees of the village are essentially the operators of Morrisville uh, Electric and Light. So when you call, you go through their billing department <laughs> to get all of the trustees. And they indicated that uh, they would prefer to go by the new general statute allowing them to designate the individual who be conveying real estate on their behalf, rather than having the specific charter provision requiring that appointment for election. Section 12 contains a transitional provision. Uh, this sort of provision gets put into the bills um, that are eliminating offices, and it protects the current term of an elected official so that they can continue in their elected office until its expiration and then the municipality will take advantage of the general law. And finally, the effective date will be July 1st, 2019. Go ahead and keep running the meeting. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Just a bit a couple. If you had some random community out there that wanted to keep this position, 
Is there anything that can prevent them from keeping it? If they do not have a charter provision that allows their legislative body to establish positions that are not required by law, they would not be able to create a town agent that no longer exists. <laughs> and if they had one currently, when that term ends, the position ends. Yes. Right. There, that wasn't. Whatever makes you happy, Mr. Chair. Please, I, I run the meeting often enough. You go right ahead and finish this, baby. <laughs> well, there's mm -hmm. no more discussion. I said you need to know about the AOF. Pardon? You need to know about the AOF. That should be automatic. <laughs> it, it is. It, it, but I'm trying to. I'm trying. <clears throat> yes. If appropriate, I would move that we approve. H one forty three as amended in draft two point one. Is is our on a second illustrious and very talented secretary? Is she's already <laughs> recording. Uh <-huh. laughs> she's got draft two point one right there and everything. Right. So who who made the motion? Chair Mr. Harrison made the motion and Mr. Kitzmiller seconded it. I don't think we need a second, right? I don't think we do. Makes me feel important. <laughs> oh, you are. Especially in your own mind. Yeah, thanks, Jim. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> thanks, I was going to do that. Thanks. Kids you were ready to go. I was, but yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, you go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go. That's right, Jim. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Roll Wicky. Yes. Declare. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Gardner. Yes. Classic. Yes. Cooper? Yes. Brownell? Yes. Colston? Yes. Copeland, Kansas? Yes. And we'll hold it open for John. Please hold it open for John. He is on assignment right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good job. Nice job, Tucker. God, you're gifted. Always a gift. <coughs> You want us to take over the cannabis for you while we're on a roll? Well. Motion to approve. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, you haven't seen the legs draft. <laughs> um, so, in response to a request from the Chair of Human Services, um, I requested that Michelle take the dispensary's language um, out of S54. And so just to help you understand what that means, um, basically S54 had contemplated taking the dispensaries out of DPS, moving them into the Cannabis Control Board so that while the Cannabis Control Board is mm -hmm. writing rules for the different kinds of licensed cannabis establishments, they could also be thinking about what makes sense to require of the medical dispensaries in in the new landscape where we have retail sales. The Human Services Committee um, has a great deal of history with having established the medical uh, marijuana uh, registry and system. Um, and for a number of reasons, complications within their uh, committee workload, they did not feel that they had the time to really think about what regulation of medical dispensaries looks like in a retail world. And so um, I think I think at some point the chair just decided to say, Uncle, you know, we, we, we don't have time to do this. We need to make the time to do it next year. So um, that it's not the end of the world and it doesn't mean that dispensaries couldn't catch up with what the new marketplace is going to look like um, <coughs> if the human services committee were to get on something in january when we get back here um, 
it just means that they're kind of being left in this sort of awkward limbo where they're still going to be operating under these very restrictive, you know, prohibition era constraints around who can enter a, a medical dispensary and who can uh, who can access and how a patient designates which dispensary they're going to use. So there's a few there's a few kind of odd uh, regulatory differences between what we have <coughs> contemplated when they're all together under the cannabis board and uh, and leaving them at TPS. But it is not the end of the world, and so I expect that, um, given my conversation with Ann yesterday, that the Human Services Committee memo will, at, at a minimum, say, strip out the dispensary language, um, and thank you for the prevention fund, I think mm -hmm. they will say that. Um, and they hopefully will also have had a chance to appreciate the good work that we did on advertising because that is also a concern of the Human Services Committee that we do everything that we can do to, um, to keep advertising of cannabis out of sight of people who are under age 21. Um, and then they also wanted to ask some questions about the public consumption restrictions because we don't want to see public consumption of cannabis. Um, and so uh, Michelle and John are both over there right now, helping them to understand how we've gotten to the very strict definition of public consumption and how, how we really expanded the restrictions on advertising and requiring pre-approval. And, um, and so my assumption is, based on the conversation I had with Ann yesterday, is that they will give us this memo, essentially making official what what she said about the committee not uh, not having time to to do all of the work that would need to be done. And so we do have a draft that the committee across the hall is looking at right now that we will begin looking at at 11 if um, Michelle is done across the way. Um, and that draft will be basically all of the final components with a few of the little decision points that we needed to come back to. So that's the plan. Any questions about that? Well, so I guess procedurally here, I'm just trying to understand, because I know you had indicated gesture you'd like to have us maybe vote this out today, mm -hmm. which I'm fine with. I'm just, so, the approach is, is to take everything out of the existing bill pertaining to the medical dispensaries. That's what they've asked us to do. Right, right. So I'm just, from a, I guess a timing perspective and a timeline, yeah. um, so we're going to approach it from strictly the retail sale aspect of it and there won't be any transitional period so I mean it's like from where we are to now all of a sudden we're going to talk about a board being able to stand up um, a, a standalone retail establishment is that sort of where we yes so the um, the extracting of the medical dispensaries really just means that we're leaving the medical dispensary language under DPS and we're leaving it alone. But we are still in, in the latest construct directing the board to create an integrated license so that the same entities who currently hold medical dispensary licenses under DPS will be able to have an integrated license under the Cannabis Control Board. They could decide they don't want to do that. They could decide we just want to uh, cultivate and manufacture and we're going to you know, we're not going to do retail or uh, or whatever. I mean, they could still decide to do other things. Um, so the medical, the entities that are medical dispensaries under DPS could be integrated licenses under the Cannabis Control Board, and that does still get us the early cultivator license, the early integrated license, so that those two are coming online at the same time. It doesn't, we stepped back from contemplating giving the dispensaries that kind of head start, that 14 month head start, because it was just becoming too complicated. DPS didn't want to 
touch the dispensaries that they were starting to grow for retail sale and moving them to the Cannabis Control Board was problematic in that time. But the entity, not the dispensary, but an entity that may indeed be the same people can acquire another license and still move in that silo. It's, it's going to be, you know, yeah. until we bring them both together under the Cannabis Control Board, it's going to be two silos. Two silos. Yeah. And um, it is what it is. So let's say that I'm, I'm one of those licensed small growers. I'm going to get my license yeah. basically on the same timeline. But who am I going to sell to? I mean, I, I was under the impression that the sort of the transition would be the medical dispensaries yep. with the retail arm. Yes. And now I'm going to have to, it's, it, we're going to have to wait and sort of stand everybody up at the same time. And that I, as a small grower, well, I guess I'd have to, we'd have to have a processor. We're, I, think, I think what you'll see in the bill is that it allows for the small cultivator to sell to either the medical dispensary mm -hmm. or the integrated, um, but yeah, the integrated license, um, which is the, the, which is the medical dispensary operating in the uh, adult sale market. So if the medical dispensaries need product for their medical side, they would be allowed to buy from the cultivators as soon as those small cultivators have something to grow. They would also be able to, to buy that for their manufacturing process so that if medical dispensaries are trying to gear up and, and make some of the other cannabis products for consumption, that they would be able to acquire product from the small cultivators. And the small cultivators are going to be under Small cultivators and everybody uh, having to do with adult sale is going to be under the Cannabis Control Board. So there will at some point be some kind of a cross between the two, if small cultivators or some mm -hmm. dispensaries. Yes. Okay. And <coughs> my hope is that with a little more time to see the way the ship is moving, that um, that we'll have a little more engagement in what makes sense as far as ongoing regulation of medical dispensaries. Do we have a new timeline? I think that would help me. Yes. Have a better I, uh, I have one copy of it right now. Okay. Um, Michelle's going to bring copies at 11. Okay. Um, or, or maybe she has sent it. To, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. up on the, on the site yet. So, so um, yeah. So is, would there, is there a plan B that if the ship across the way doesn't sail in the direction that torpedoes. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, is so. I mean, I'm hearing you say that the, the medical dispensaries are still sort of <coughs> still the linchpin mm -hmm. to this whole thing. And I'm saying, is is there a way to get around that? Well, what makes sense? I mean, what in an ideal world? We're looking at this from a policy perspective, kind of more broadly than just looking at the medical dispensaries. What makes sense? Well, I mean, traditionally, what we've been talking about, I think, makes the sense. But you know, if that's going to prove to be an obstacle, then what would make sense is you stand the board up, they go through, do their rulemaking, you issue the licensing to the appropriate functions, growers, processors, whatever, mm -hmm. and you go to a, a, a retail market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just do to our timeline that we had scheduled within the bill. So this has the board um, opening up the application period for cultivators and integrated licenses in January of 21. So that they would, before February of 21, be issuing licenses for those integrated entities and, um, and for the small cultivators. The licensing of the broader retail establishment wouldn't be until July of 2021. So they wouldn't be issuing licenses for 
anybody other than the five integrated entities um, until July of 2021. But before that, cultivators would be able to sell to the integrated licensees or to or ultimately to the product manufacturers who, who will begin getting licenses in May. And the, you know, the construct of staggering this was really that you have to get your cultivators on board growing first, and then you can kind of spread your workload out while you license the laboratories and the manufacturers and then the retailers. So it is it is a slower timeline than we had contemplated when we were talking about trying to Trying to fast track the dispensaries into the adult sale, um, but this is still. I mean, this is a typical timeline when you look at what the other states who have gone to a retail market have done. It takes generally two years to get to get a system up and going, and so you know we're we're still looking at um, a very typical timeline. So this pushes everything. Looks like if I'm reading the prior timeline correctly, it looks like it pushes it back about a year. Right. Without without the dispensaries first, it pushes back retail sales about a year, which you know is not the end of the world. I mean, <clears throat> it's going to give heartburn to the committee across the hall, um, the appropriations committee, because they're going to be saying, "What? How long are we floating this <coughs> and standing up the board?" Um, but on the other hand, it gives municipalities another, um, so then the municipalities would have another election uh, at town meeting day in order to decide whether they want to opt out before retail licenses are, are issued in July of that year. Is that the new one? This one? is uh, the 24th. I, the new one we posted. That's the new one? No, no, we'll be posted in a minute. Oh, okay. okay. Will it be on today's calendar or, I mean, today's schedule? In one day. Yes. Yeah. If she can type and talk at the same time. <laughs> I looked for it, but I didn't I see it. I haven't been involved in this at all, so. Who wants to report 143? <laughs> Go, Rob. Woo. Do it. Thank you. All right, I'm on today. Refresh it one more time. Are you going to do a side by side so we can see both at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd have Peggy come in. Sure, yeah, can't you do that? Let's do the side by side here, Mr. Whiskey. Oh, he did it that yesterday. Is very appropriate where we can compare the two. Do you? No, in all seriousness, do you want a side by side of two timelines? Yeah. Sure. See what changed. Oh, yeah. Right now. Well, That's a good I can't hear you actually you. ask that question. You're, you're and what? I have to now. I have to find where I went. Yeah. I lost it. See? Are you talking about in general or just on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the latest draft is posted as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think next session we can fix up the seating. <laughs> 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 Wow, look at you with your handy dandy side by sides. 
really doesn't change in that the board stands up in the fall of 19, um, appoints its advisory committee in December of 19, um, January re makes recommendations on fees, but then <coughs> begins its rulemaking process. So it's really in um, <coughs> July 1 of 2020, the new fees would need to take effect that would be presented um, to the General Assembly next year. And then they would do final rules by December of 2020 so that they can begin the application period in January of 21. So how much influence does the committee across the way have as far as I guess they're going to weigh in on roles and responsibility, but would they have purview over like what agency has oversight, as whether it be the board or Department of Public Safety? Um, well, right now, right now they are essentially exercising that, and um, whether it makes sense for it to beyond this year in that way is really the question that they're going to have to grapple with. jump out at you about the timeline that you've had a chance to digest it. executive director and realizes, oh my God, there's no way that we right. can fit this timeline. So they come back to us next January and yeah. say, we'd like you to give us an extra two months here or three months there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no. It just seems that the, the from the date of issuing the cultivator license, I think it's on February 15th, mm -hmm. to the time where it's available for retail, like five months in July. So what that what that recognizes is that um, I think that contemplates lifting the plant count for the integrated licensees okay. earlier. 
so that they probably will still have product ready to sell before <coughs> okay before cultivators have product ready to yep. to help uh, provide for the okay. retail market did contemplate them coming over so that the board could be <coughs> figuring out how to regulate them at the same time. And maybe this construct actually lightens the board's workload between now and as much as a year from now right. when we finally get something yeah. in motion. And there's some facts. Um, well. You know, the, the, I guess the question mark and the worry is that um, there's been reluctance on the part of the Human Services Committee to do anything to change the medical um, system. And it's unfortunate that we couldn't, you know, have a, have a more robust conversation about what makes sense from what we've heard by hearing testimony from the dispensaries and what we've seen in going to tour them, that there is a question about how they will, how they will be able to continue to exist to provide for medical patients if they're not given a, a, a way to get into the retail market. Nelson? What I've seen though is the control board is making up when people can apply and what people can do. They actually could write something which allows the dispensary to move over and get licensed under them. Right, so I'm thinking of this now as two different names. There's a medical dispensary and there is a mirror entity which is that integrated licensing and so they're going to have to be they're going to have to have a sort of a split personality for a while until we can get the, the folks across the hall to engage in what makes sense to move them over and, and i agree with that and what i'm saying is that this control board could favor giving dispensaries a license sooner with what we were trying to do they could mm -hmm. actually come up with a plan on how they do that yeah takes the responsibility off for a while, which is... Well, and the other thing that it does, though, is that we had contemplated moving the DPS positions over into yeah. the Cannabis Control Board, which would be uh, a benefit to stand up the activities of the board with, with positions that are already being funded mm -hmm. through the, the medical dispensary um, fee structure. I suppose we can still get to that next year. Jim? So uh, you would be a better person to judge the ramifications, but what if we, I mean, I understand that they might not be comfortable across the hall with the, the new medical marijuana <coughs> guidelines uh, that the Senate put in, um, nor may they be comfortable with S-117, which is in their committee. Mm -hmm. um, but what would the possibility, and I just throw this out, um, is taking the existing medical marijuana uh, guidelines, statutes, and just throwing it as is into the section and putting it onto the board sooner. Like we had it contemplated in the original S54, then you wouldn't have the timeline issue. 
Well, <coughs> the timeline issue would be a bit relieved. The problem is that it would have the board enforcing a regulatory structure that is much more stringent than what we're contemplating and doesn't include some of the consumer protection aspects that we're contemplating. For instance, um, medical dispensaries are not required to test their product. But the new regulated market is going to be required to test the product. So do you have some product coming through the dispensary that isn't being tested because they're sitting under the old DPS rules? Or do you overlay them and say, you know, you need to operate under the strictest testing guidelines, but also the strictest patient constraint guidelines? So, I mean, it really, it is a, it is an illogical space yeah, to be in. Yeah, I'm just asking the question. I need to look for a yeah. way to bridge the two, perhaps. But that's, that's fine. It's not, I, I'm not hung up. Um, I mean, I think, I think from what I'm hearing that there's a clear committee position here that we think bringing them out of DPS mm -hmm. and making some logical, sensible changes mm -hmm. to their regulatory structure makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what those logical regulatory changes are is technically the purview of the committee across the hall and they weren't ready mm -hmm. to engage in the details of that. So thus we have this strange situation. Nelson? We have dispensary testimony where they were actually looking for some of the things like the, the checking of the level TEC, the cleanliness of the kitchens. They're asking for for some of the stuff that we're putting in this bill, right. which they will not get if they stay where they are. Yep. So it's yeah. So it's not that we're forcing them something mm -hmm. that they're asking. Right. And in addition to asking for that testing and consumer protection requirements, they'd like to be relieved of some of the things like <clears throat> a patient has to declare which dispensary mm -hmm. is their dispensary and thou shalt never, you know, go into another dispensary. I mean that that is kind of the epitome of the most nonsensical mm -hmm. restriction that in a new in the new regulatory landscape we would want to leave open. I mean if you became a medical patient and you chose Montpelier because you were living in Barrie and then you moved, to, the moved to Rutland and all of a sudden you you know, in order to get what you need from your medical dispensary you're having to drive an hour and a half. That's yeah. crazy. Makes no sense. You could just sign up to go to Brandon. Can you change that now? I mean can't you I think the the well, I don't know. I don't know if you can amend your registry, but when you you have to renew your registry every one or two years, I can't remember which. And and when you renew, I believe you can change dispensaries. Um, but I don't know whether you could say, oh, I'm moving from you know Franklin County to Wyndham County, and I need to. Um, I really don't know. Well, let's take a ten minute break. So those sections of the bill have been all removed. I think there's only one change we are making to the medical dispensary laws, which is to allow them to start growing earlier. Yep. Yep. So the so in here, um, the call is that part of the of this proposal from that came from the Senate and what you guys have all been working under, and um, is that uh, in the I, what was in there was that uh, at the beginning of 21, the program shift from DPS over to be regulated by the board, and that you have these new statutory schemes that would be more integrated with the commercial system, and that the board would have been developing rules for the medical program at the same time as the commercial, thinking that they're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of overlap. Um, and so all of that is out. So 
with respect to the current registry program and the dysregulation of the dispensaries, that is all, as far as this proposal is concerned, that is all staying under DPS, under those existing uh, statutes, under Title 18, under the rules adopted by public safety, and, um, and so what you will have is you will have that continue to operate under that system and then you will have a commercial system regulated by the board. So you have two regulatory systems. Um, dispensary will be able to apply for an integrated license under the new commercial system, but they would um, be doing that under the new regulatory system and they would run their dispensary under the old system. Questions? So, JP? I guess I'd like to hear briefly DPS comments on this again. Just briefly, because the part of that DPS is really not interested in telling us. So, JP? We have, uh, we have made this change upon the recommendation of the committee who has jurisdiction over the medical dispensary system. And I don't know if the Sorry. Human Services Committee chose to take <coughs> testimony from DPS. Did they take t testimony from DPS? Not today. Not today. No. And the, they did take testimony last Thursday, but it was only an explanation of basically how the process worked. It was not to ask their opinions about this bill. Are there any other questions for Michelle about the timeline? So the way just to think about how this will work is that um, you, you may, the legislature may choose next year to come back look at the medical registry and look at those statutes and look at maybe further integration or do something like that so that can be done in a future uh, a future legislative year um, it, the issue is that if they're going to look at uh, an integration at some point they still have to be rule making so you have the medical kind of lagging behind what the commercial is but if at some point the legislature does want to tackle that and look at having a unified regulatory system instead of having two regulatory systems you could do that it just won't be it won't be happening at the same time Nelson. but it's clear that the dispensary at some point can apply when this uh, regulatory board, this new board uh, comes up with, other than to do sales and licensing, it doesn't mean that the dispensary can't apply for those licenses. Sure. It'd be just... They'd yep, be it's actually, it's just leave. it's kind of just freezing that program, and, but and commercial will get up and running, and those people who run the dispensary can apply into the new system under the commercial. Yep. And so looking at the new timeline, I'll go through this just quickly, and then we'll start to walk through the bill. Um, so, uh, still kind of the general stuff around getting the board organized, getting them rolling in the fall, uh, beginning to draft the rules. Now they're only drafting rules for the new commercial system, not for the medical any longer. Developing a strategic plan for the second and third year rollout, um, coming up with the proposal for fees. Um, I put in here, uh, because you've worked so much on the advisory committee, you now have, rather than the, only the board appointing to the advisory committee, you have independent folks appointing to the advisory committee, so I thought you, you wanted to have some kind of date, it doesn't matter to me obviously what it is, but I thought you should have some kind of date where the other appointing authorities are told to make their appointments to the advisory committee, and so I just put in there December 1st. Um, for appointments to the advisory committee. Uh, then you have the same uh, timeline with regard to January for reporting to the General Assembly. Um, you have the same as the previous drafts for initiating rulemaking March 1st of next year. Um, uh, there are a few things they have to report back to. One of the, th the new things is about whether or not um, 
cannabis product manufacturers should be considered a food manufacturing establishment for purposes of regulation by DOH. Um, July 1st of next year, you have the new fees take effect. November of next year, you have the board reporting on a few things um, around uh, outreach and training and employment, the online uh, ordering and delivery, and additional types of licenses. By the end of next year, you'd see the final adoption of the rules. And then in January of 21, you would have uh, the application period would open for cultivators and integrated licensees. And we'll look a little more at the integrated license language. Um, uh, we did last time, but we'll take another peek at that. And so, uh, again, the, the five existing dispensaries would be able to apply for the integrated licenses in January of 21. Um, something I realize I should probably put in here is that in September of 20, so prior to dispensaries being able to apply for an integrated license, four months before that, the caps would be lifted for the dispensaries. And so the dispensaries could start to cultivate a uh, product to be able to then transfer to an integrated licensee so that they would be able to start selling relatively quickly once they're licensed in 2021. Um, so, but again, the integrated licensees and cultivators are on the same track in terms of timeline. Um, uh, it also, uh, so then you have to start issuing those licenses no later than February 15th, um, and then that opens an application period for testing labs. We didn't want to kick the testing labs down too far because the cultivators will be able to have their products tested at an integrated licensee because they're allowed to test and they can test for other licensees, but you might want other testing labs to be able to come online if there's others. Um, so uh, you begin issuing licenses for labs in April, um, and then you open the application period for product manufacturers and wholesalers at that time. You begin uh, issuing those licenses for product manufacturers and wholesalers in May, open up for retailers in June, and you begin issuing for retailers in July. Retailers can be able, as soon as they're licensed, they can start selling to the public if they have products and they're all ready to go. So when you think about it, you may have the first sales being from an integrated licensee, of which there can only be a maximum of five. You might see those as early as January, February 21, and then you'll see them in as early as July of 21 for the new retailers. Okay. So on, on that particular issue, um, are we still setting the fee, or is that going to come back with a recommendation? That's coming back with recommendations. Yeah. So I'm going to go through and I'll, I'm going to hit the highlights. Um, so I did not highlight all the stuff I removed from the bill. Just it was all you know. There was like big swaths, and then there was all integrated with just a lot of cross references and stuff. And I just thought it kind of cluttered up having to highlight all those. But just know that anything relating to the existing medical registry or dispensaries operating as dispensaries serving patients gone. Um, so um, first change is on page two on cannabis product. And uh, so uh, Representative Gannon had asked uh, that I add something to address to just to make absolutely clear that when you're talking about a cannabis product, um, that it includes vaporizer cartridges that contain the oil that are used with, with battery powered devices. Um, because he wanted to make sure that it wasn't just the cannabis oil in them that was being tested because there's concerns um, with some, especially on the illegal market, um, and then some that they were seeing actually that were tested in California, that the actual mechanical device that contains the oil um, had uh, lead or heavy metals in there that were not safe um, for people to, uh, to be ingesting. And so just this is just a clarification that 
So by adding it to the definition of cannabis product, it's clear that when they're testing products and there's requirements for testing products that they take into consideration that it's, that it's also that delivery device that contains the oil. Um, this is, I just um, needed to amend the, the duties of the board. So, um, so now it's just applying to the, uh, to the commercial system, no longer. So, um, just process question. Uh, we have open questions that um, I know what it says here. Uh, I have suggested a different appointment process, and I wondered if we're going to do these as we go through, or if we're saving those for a food fight at the end. Let's have a food fight at the end. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, I, I think I think what would be helpful is if we can get a first. Run sure. through the bill, understand, understand what the yeah. structure of the bill is, and then we can come back and do our final markup yeah. and vote. Yeah. And then we will tick off. So if you can flag them for me, that would yeah. be great. Okay. Thank you. So we will come back to board points. So uh, next is on the advisory committee. So um, uh, so so I'm talking with the chair and vice chair. They asked me to look at um, so remember your previous version said that the advisory committee shall contain people with certain expertise, not not a, not limited to that, but should certain expertise should be contained on the advisory board. And then they discussed with I think other folks about whether or not there should be um, certain people making those appointments. And so the way that this is structured is that so that the advisory committee shall include at a minimum um, you have. The governor appointing three of those people to the advisory committee. And again, remember, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just that it has to have these folks on it. The governor appoints somebody with business management, regulatory compliance experience, someone in public health, and a member with expertise in lab science or toxicology. The House will appoint someone um, with expertise in systemic social justice and equity issues, and someone with expertise in women and minority owned business ownership experience. Um, uh, oh, that's twice. Yep. It's, it's still on there. Oh, no, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, I thought that um, editing would pick that up. So, um, ignore H because it's a duplication. No, it's, um, yeah, there's a couple things that are wrong in there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Let's come back to that. I need to take a look at that and see what happened there. Um, but basically what it does is it takes the, the list of folks that y'all had on the last draft and divvies them up among the five appointing authorities that you have for the board. So let me look, take a look at that and see where that got screwed up. Just and the governor it. gets three appointments. Governor gets three. Other folks get two. <laughs> um, those appointments have to be made uh, on or before December 1st of this year so that they can kind of get seated and be able to um, be there as a resource for the board as they initiate rulemaking. Um, board may appoint members in addition to those who are identified in subdivision one to not be construed to the board in any way. And then the board may establish subcommittees within the advisory committee. And just so that, uh, so our committee understands the committee across the hall wanted to be sure that the Department of Health would be able to help appoint somebody to the advisory commission and uh, advisory committee. And so the governor does have that public health uh, appointment to the advisory committee. Um, and that will be, I'm sure, in consultation with the experts in the Department of Health. Raise your hand. No. I'm just seeing things out of the corner of my Sorry. Head. Rob? Um, I, I'm just a, did I miss the discussion when we were going through and appointing the advisory committee members? And I yes. thought that. Yes. Did I miss that? Must be? You, you did. It was a 
it was in response to concerns that John and I were hearing outside of the committee when people started to and realize that there was that the board was not this is your plant science expert this is your business and regulatory expert this is your social justice expert um, and when they realized that we would extracted that expertise and created an advisory committee uh, they wanted to make sure that different appointing entities had control over different membership of that advisory committee so it is an attempt to hybridize the old version with the new version and still give uh, different authorities the ability to uh, to appoint people who will advise the board. Okay. <laughs> yes. We need to point. need to grant appointing authority to the junior member from Barrytown. Um. <laughs> <laughs> to consult on delivery services. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Matt. We, Thank you. Uh, Chair. <laughs> Not quite yet. Wrong room. <laughs> Just coloring it. I fixed his glasses so that I can return them. <laughs> he flagged me down yesterday and he was like, I want my glasses back. And I said, well, how many pieces did you want them in? Because right now there are three pieces. <laughs> she didn't wear them Friday night. Yeah. I noticed that too. Yeah. I wondered if it had anything to do with the schedule. She also attributed a meeting to me that I had never had. And I had to, <laughs> had to do some work to make sure nobody thought that I... It's not in the bill. Yes. <laughs> this is all just, you know, scuttlebutt around the building. All right, let's go back to the um, so the next change. Page 16, so this is on the reporting section with the board coming back to y'all next year, um, is with a recommendation about whether or not the product manufacturer should be uh, regulated um, by the Department of Health as other food manufacturing establishments are, so they would come back to you next year. March, beginning of March, so ideally I'm envisioning I'm still here, I'll be working on some <laughs> I'll be working on cannabis legislation next year. There's some and text if it doesn't kill me. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, whatever bill is being considered, whatever, if they come in and say, you know, absolutely these folks are making cookies, it doesn't matter if it contains cannabis or not, they should be uh, inspected, then you guys can slip that in whatever you guys are working on at the time. Um, uh, I also I, I uh, put on here for the date for November of next year for the the training and employment. Again, I'm trying to stage it so it's not all you know like front end where they're working on the heavy lift because the reality is is they're not going to be engaging in any outreach training or employment programs until really the the next year so I think it's still you know before any before anybody's licensed things like that so um, it just gives a little space for the board to be focused on the other things at the beginning um, I So uh, I think, believe that the vice chair brought up the issue in committee about wherever we have uh, warnings that are listed, um, that there will be additional warning that cannabis should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. So that is, you'll see that in a few different places here. It's contained in the advertising section. Um, but it's also with regard to some labeling and some um, um, that you'll see later on. We want to touch on. It's up to you on whether or not you want us to go into the human services discussions while we're on advertising. Maybe it makes sense. I think so. Okay. So, human services suggested two changes um, here to the warnings. Twenty-five. So number. Can you go to the warnings? Yep. Please? Uh, see, where is it? Uh, okay, there they are. So for number two, they're just like cannabis has intoxic <coughs> intoxicating effects and may impair con concentration, coordination, and judgment, and, should, and you should not operate heavy equipment. That's what 
to one of that. Um, this is pre construction. I see two furrowed brows. <laughs> Anybody want to say something about that? You're going to go there, I'd say. <clears throat> The equipment is like big cranes and bulldozers. I don't think. Should Automot be operating automobiles, motor vehicles? motorcycles. Okay. Yeah. Who, who, who's got the equipment? It's machinery. It's. You know. Should you? Can you do a riding lawnmower? Um. That was their suggestion. We could say vehicles who? or heavy equipment. Yeah, vehicles and heavy equipment. I think that's what they meant. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. We don't want uh, somebody probably. driving a Prius to think that because it's right. light equipment that they sh somehow aren't included in that warning. Right. You also <laughs> want to add a, a fourth warning, uh, which is, uh, and we'll need to tweak this language because they weren't very specific, but um, the use of cannabis uh, may lead to a dependence. In some adults. In some adults. With the there, that's, that's good. They had initially said they wanted their floated ideas that causes psychosis or there's health problems, and, and the health department Jumped came in, in and said, you know, this is the one this thing that they want. would recommend is that um, rather than the other ones, um, again, you know, when you have to make a distinction, they were talking a lot about, well, what's on cigarettes or what's on alcohol? And the issue, because there's not testing, um, and studies allowed on cannabis, it's, it's different. So you don't have a Surgeon General's warning about certain things. And so the health department recommended around the, de the dependence one. And I can I can work that language. I can check in with Shayla. Right Thank you. I her. create dependency. Right. Is that she, she had said that may lead to dependence in some adults. And so. Yeah, I think the important thing is that it be factual. If it if we're putting a warning label on that that then becomes disproven by a study right. in a year or a year and a half, um, then that makes no sense. But I think it's, anything else? Yes, so going to E, which is right under the highlighted one, um, this is about advertising. Review, no, 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 go back up. See where it says the board may? Um, they recommend that to the board shall. require a specific to be disclosure to be made in advertisement in a clear and conspicuous mm -hmm. manner if the board determines that the advertisement will be false or misleading without such a disclosure. Um, so from a legislative drafting standpoint? I think it's fine because I think that sense. the second parts of those sentences where it talks about if the board determines the advertisement would be false or misleading, I think it's fine to have shall. And I think the same on the road is that if it's necessary to protect public health, then they shall. So I think it's fine. Great. Questions, committee? I see a thumbs up. Are we all good? All right. We will include those changes. Um, one other thing, <coughs> not here, maybe I'll just mention. Uh, So these are the changes. Uh, and so under rulemaking, starting page 30, going into page 31, um, these are the changes that y'all discussed with David Hall and um, uh, the other day around um, dealing with the clarification around information that is provided to the board and then what information would be um, part of the allowable under the public records request and what would be exempt. So I'm assuming y'all are all clear on that. Sorry. Yep. Bob? So is there anything either in the application process or the decision on the granting of licenses, yada yada, that's going to be confusing or any other thing when there's a bridge between the entity controlled by the DPS as opposed to the campus control board in terms of their actual structures and they need to be different corporate entities or is that in any way? Um, the, the language that allows for the, um, uh, the 
this point, I'm asking right. because at this point it seems like all of a sudden they're controlling somebody that's growing and selling to somebody else. I'm sorry, say that again? It seems like there's going to be a period of time when I could have missed this where DPS is going to be controlling some entity that's going to be growing and possibly selling to. Under a different license structure. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. You're going to have one entity and they're going to operate under this system for selling cannabis. And then they're going to operate under a different system for selling cannabis. The cell is not going to be medically related. Right. It just seems like a big flag for that. Um, they're going to need they're going to need some lawyers. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michelle, we should try to pick a logical stopping point that leaves the sure. committee five minutes before lunch to go over something that's coming up on the floor. Sure. So, um, let me scroll through. There's. Um, Pregnant breastfeeding language, adding it through the warnings. Um, uh, this is something on the integrated licenses um, that Representative Harrison had brought up around location. So you think about the when you think about the five individual types of licenses, you can only have one location of each of those. Um, and then the question is like, well, if you're an integrated licensee. How does that apply to you? So if you're an integrated licensee and you're allowed to do all of those, um, you have to do them all under one roof or not. And so I added language so that the integrated license shall permit only one location for each of the type of activities permitted by the license, cultivation, wholesale, product manufacturing, retail sales, and testing. So they may you know, choose so they could have a maximum of five places, but they could only have one location where they would be doing point of sales. You know, they're probably just gonna you know, aggregate where they can, right? So maybe they have their cultivation and product manufacturing in one place, <coughs> they're not even doing any wholesaling, um, and then they're doing, you know, retail sales in some other location, but that it wouldn't restrict them to only one location to have to meet all of those needs. Does that make sense? Questions on that concept, committee? So I was trying to just make it similar to what other people could do. So let's say if you didn't have an integrated license and a dispensary wanted to do all five things, they get one of each five licenses and they could have five locations to do one to do each one of those activities. It's just, it clarifies that that's the step. It's the same for them under the integrated. Can they have one place to do more than one thing? Sure. <coughs> Section H, bottom page 41, this is just the PRA language tweak that y'all already approved yesterday. So there's a few little places in here that as I was going through the bill that I thought just needed to be trued up a little bit where you have around who can do what and who can sell to whom and who can purchase from whom and the, um, so I added, and so when you're thinking about a dispensary, so there's places in here where dispensaries can sell and purchase from some of these licensees, but there were other places where it just didn't, it didn't match up, so it wasn't consistent, so I just added it in there. So um, just adding that a wholesaler is allowed to purchase from a dispensary. Um, same with a product manufacturer, see that it had there that they could sell but it didn't say that you could purchase. And so in thinking about having the most viability for the dispensaries and being able to work between the dispensaries and them also being to work with the other licensees under the commercial and also their integrated license or other integrated licensees adding that in there. Um, Brown? I don't know if it's the right place to ask this question. And for some reason, I seem to have missed it, but as far as transporting the product, mm -hmm. Let's say that you know I'm a, a cultivator and I'm selling it to a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. No limits on how much of the product can be transported at a long time. Well, the board's going to adopt the rules with regard to transportation and, uh, okay. and, and uh, some what they can do around that. That's not right. So it's yep. not board approved. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, 
So again, uh, the retailer giving them the ability to purchase from a dispensary. It might be that um, you know, a dispensary carries a particular strain or a particular product that they make that a retailer may want to may want to carry as well, and so allows them to be able to purchase that from a dispensary. Um, this is just a technical on the testing laboratory license. Um, adding in there, I think there's just an oversight that testing labs uh, not only test cannabis, but they also test cannabis products um, for other licensees or for dispensaries or members of the public. for implementation of the licenses, and we'll go through this and then I'll maybe stop, it might be a good stopping point, but just to review. So, as of September 1st of next year, the dispensary caps on, on being able, how much they can grow, things like that, would lift. Um, they would be permitted to then cultivate cannabis and produce products for the purpose of transferring or selling them to an integrated licensee after January 5th of 2021. So that's the time when, when those dispensaries could start applying for those integrated licenses. So if you had a dispensary and then they obtained an integrated license, they could then transfer or sell some can some flour or products to that to their to the integrated licensee that may be them as well, or it could be another integrated licensee. Again, maybe kind of sharing products, you know, saying I want to offer this and I don't throw this, that sort of thing. Um, and so uh, they would be able to do that. Um, so the caps would lift in the fall and then they could start transferring and selling in January once they're licensed under the new system. Everybody follow for that? And then this, we just, we've already talked kind of about the timeline. Um, again, I just want to point out that those integrated licenses are happening at the same time as the cultivation licenses, and there's the pri still the priority for the small cultivators is in there. Um, I moved the testing labs. Um, I kind of moved those around. Again, I'm trying to avoid having too many license applications at any one time. So since we're doing integrated licenses and cultivators at the beginning, I've just bumped testing labs a little bit down the road, but not too far because if there are people who just want to obtain a testing lab, um, we want to make sure there's as many testing laboratory <coughs> options as possible out there for licensees because everybody's going to be required to test their products and it's not going to Ag Lab because Ag Lab is only doing compliance testing. So I didn't want to push it out too far because you may have cultivators who are coming up with product kind of early on in the, in the, in the scheme of things and you want to give them as many testing opportunities as possible. And there, I have to say, it's really hard to delete like pages and pages. <laughs> <laughs> but there's all the can all the medical stuff is, is out. Um, so, uh, um, on the taxes, I'll just say basically, there's a lot of changes in with the tax stuff, and that's just basically adding in that new. I wanted you guys to be cool with the integrated license on the last draft, and now that you are. We just incorporated that all into the taxes because you now, you know, the previous draft only had it for retailers. Now you have it for integrated licensees as well. And that makes me think I gotta add that. Well no, I don't know that it makes a difference in the municipal thing. People just they want to ban them, they'll ban them. And I think I'll check to make well, sure the that integrated licensees are already in effect. I mean they're already in existence, right? No, that doesn't exist now, just dispensaries. So uh, I would say a town could ban an integrated licensee. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Um, uh, you could make a policy decision that they can't, and I can add that in there, but because they would be one of the six types of licenses under the new commercial system. Right. But an integrated licensee, just because it has the same owners and controlling principles as a dispensary does not make them a dispensary. Right. Um, 
So, but the tax stuff, again, uh, you know, I had to true that all up because it applies not to just the taxes collected by a retailer, but taxes now that will be collected by an integrated licensee. Mm -hmm. So there's just, a, so there's a bunch of changes to the tax stuff, but it's not really um, anything new substantively for you. Um, there's the, uh, and then I just added all of, you have your, misuse prevention fund stuff, which we've talked about quite a bit, and then I added all the um, recommendations of the Judiciary Committee. So those all go for about 15 pages, and I added in the language on safety belts. So that's all in there. Um, <coughs> Understanding from, I don't know, did health care report to you guys yet? Mm -hmm. So they're all good, so I took the shading out for that. So you've got your CBD, FDA approved that's in there. You have your ag lab changes in there. Those are all the same. Um, and then I just had to change the effective dates. And literally, we made it actually all the way through. So. Wow. Excellent. So committee, I'm going to ask you to um, use any free time that you have between now and when the floor is done to go through and you know flag the sections of the bill that you'd like us to have some more uh, committee discussion on, and um, you know we know we know what some of those decision points are that we've been uh, leaving to come back to. Um, and so after the floor, my intention is for us to come back and do. Uh, final markup and, and vote on this bill. So, if you need to find quiet space and, and want to, you know, spend some time going through the bill, um, we will go through it more slowly this afternoon um, and uh, and take the opportunity to make sure that we are comfortable with the way all of the pieces fit together. And we'll come back to our few decision points. Um, make sense? Okay, before we leave to go to lunch, we have uh, a House bill that is back from the Senate, and I'm going to ask John to describe the voluminous changes that the Senate made to the bill. Just kidding. It's actually quite straightforward, um, so that we can decide before we head to the floor whether we are going to concur. So that's once under the calendar? Uh, yeah, 526. Yeah. Concur, concur with further proposal of amendment, not concur, and Request a committee of conference. Or blow the whole thing up. There. Yeah. Or take it hostage. Take it back. But this is this is the town clerk fee bill. So <coughs> yes, we're this gonna is a, do the what? town clerk fee bill. And as you can tell, on the left is the two proposed amendments um, from the Senate. And basically what they are doing is adding a single word in two places, which is the word time so that when it's in the endorsement section, which is section nine of the bill, which is so when the clerk endorses a, a document for recording, they will put on the certificate, not just the date, but also the time. 